so, uh, so this work is done with uh, uh, my student, uh, Orchard Professor, he's a graduate student here, and uh, Manas Kulkarni, who's at the City University of New York. And so, the, so what I'm talking about, most of the hard work is really done by Orchard and Manas, and uh, Orchard will be giving a poster, so people can uh, get, uh, like, if uh, those who are interested can get all the details from the poster. So I'll just give a sort of uh, introduction to what we are trying to look at. Uh, Okay, so the basic uh, thing what we want to understand is like open quantum systems, okay, and why is this interesting? Uh, if you, you want to understand like, so there are recent experiments where you take a benzene molecule, so there's a six uh, carbon atoms around this ring, and uh, then uh, you connect them to like gold leads or something, and you measure the current going around them. This, uh, you apply a battery and you measure the current. So you want to understand like uh, electrical transport in this very small uh, system and you need to un do quantum mechanics. Uh, the, another system is uh, like, uh, it's called the non-equilibrium spin boson model. So, you, uh, so this is kind of what uh, Sujit just talked about, like you have uh, atom and it's, it's in a cavity interacting with uh, let's say radiation field or uh, I phonon fields or some bosonic field. And uh, it's possible that you can arrange it in such a way that it's connected to two uh, fields which are at different temperatures. Okay? And then you want to know how, uh, what is like, how does heat transfer across this system? Okay, so these are the kind of systems that what one would like to understand. And so uh, what one needs to do is to, uh, so in both these cases, you'll see that there are uh, this reservoirs, there's what I call the system, and it's interacting with reservoirs which are at different uh, chemical potentials or at different temperatures. Uh, so basically, we want to uh, to describe such non-equilibrium processes. We need an effective dynamics of a system interacting with reservoirs, and these reservoirs could be heat reservoirs or particle reservoirs. Okay. So in classical systems, uh, I mean, uh, what uh, one knows that uh, a good way to describe such systems is like a Langevin equation, for example, which describes, for example, motion of a Brownian particle interacting with a reservoir, uh, which is the fluid. Or uh, then uh, another description is like the cocker plank equation, which uh, tells us how the probability distribution in phase space of a system evolves. Okay, so the, again, this uh, system is interacting with the reservoir, and so it has an effective dynamics, and the cocker plank equation describes the dynamics. Okay, for quantum systems, uh, I mean, there's a, an equivalent description in terms of quantum Langevin equations, uh, and uh, but this uh, description again, you write an effective equation for a system uh, by uh, integrating out the reserved degrees of freedom, and it's mostly useful for kind of non-interacting systems. Okay, and this is an uh, exact approach, and uh, at least uh, when you want to get steady-state properties. The other approach that uh, is widely used is uh, this approach of master equations. The simplest uh, master equation is rate equation, and I just uh, which a uh, lot of people will be familiar with. And then there are things called rate field equations, Lindblad equations, and these are all approximate descriptions okay, of a quantum system interacting with reservoirs. Okay, and uh, these are used to uh, quite often to understand open quantum systems. Okay, so let me just talk about rate equations, which a lot of people will be familiar with. And it's like if you have a two-level atom uh, with energy states E1 and E2, uh, and uh, let's say the difference in energy is some h cross omega. Uh, and let's say this atom is in a thermal radiation field. Okay, so this is uh, something that was studied by Einstein, and he, like when he uh, talked about his theory of stimulated uh, emission. So uh, you have this system the, which has two levels, and you can ask what are the probabilities of finding uh, the system in level one and level two, and how this, how do these probabilities change when you like suddenly put this system in the in a thermal uh, bath, which is the radiation field. Okay, so uh, I mean then what you can do is. Uh, so let's say the radiation field has some uh, distribution, which is basically given by the Planck distribution. And then Einstein's theory tells you, uh, for example, that the rate at which uh, this uh, population of uh, the lower level changes is, uh, so there is uh, stimulated emission. Uh, this is the coefficient, rate of transition from level two to level one, and this is proportional to the radiation field uh, density. And then there's an, a spontaneous emission, which, is, which gives a radiation a rate of transition from two to one. Okay, and then there is a probability of transition from one to two. Okay, so it's just uh, these two differences gives you the way the probabilities in the two levels changes. Okay, now this A and B can, if you know the uh, Hamiltonian of the system plus bath, 
uh, and there's some coupling which is a, like a dipole coupling between the uh, atom and the field. Then you can calculate all these transition coefficients just by using Fermi Golden Rule. Okay. So it's just perturbation theory. Okay, so this is, I mean, a sort of quantum theory, but it's not completely quantum uh, because, uh, I mean, why is it not a complete com quantum description? Because a full quantum description of a two level system requires you to write its uh, re density matrix. This is a two cross two matrix which has diagonal elements, uh, row one and row two, which are just the probabilities of finding the system in the two states. But it also has an off diagonal part, row one, two, which has like information on some quantum aspects. So therefore, I mean, this rate description is not a completely quantum description, though it has some quantum aspects, like you have transition rates, which you can do, uh, derive by a quantum uh, calculation. Uh, okay, so the quantum master equations uh, actually describe uh, this, uh, the full uh, uh, evolution equation for the density matrix of a system. So the full system, you should remember, is system plus reservoir, but then you look at the reduced density matrix of the system and want to write an effective equation, and that's what the quantum master equation is doing. Okay, so the starting point in all these cases is to look at uh, uh, Hamiltonian given by uh, uh, system plus uh, Hamiltonian for a reservoir, and then there's some coupling, and it's assumed that this coupling is kind of weak, okay. So, uh, this is also what we do when we do uh, detect Fermi's golden rule, uh, like uh, to describe transitions in atoms and all. Okay. So, the coupling is assumed to be weak, and in this theory also it's taken to be weak. Okay. And the bath is always a non-interacting system in the sense of like, uh, uh, it's described by a quadratic Hamiltonian. It's like a radiation field, okay. So it's, uh, the bath is always, it could be a radiation field or it could be an electron gas when you want to consider like uh, transport across a molecule. Uh, so this is the basic starting point in all cases. Uh, the system itself can have interactions and can be quite complicated, but the bath is uh, always uh, non-interacting. Okay, so the uh, main steps uh, that uh, go into deriving this master equation are basically you write a uh, equation, uh, uh, I mean, for, so you have the full density matrix of the system which I called chi, uh, and this chi I indi uh, just indicates that I am using something called the interaction representation. And then the equation of motion for this full density matrix is given by something like this. Okay, so this is commutator of the uh, system bath interaction and uh, uh, and uh, there's this small parameter epsilon. So then, uh, uh, the, uh, starting from this uh, exact equation, you want to derive an e uh, equation for the reduced density matrix, which is uh, basically the full density matrix, and then you trace out the path degrees. Okay, so uh, to do this, you have to do what is called the bond Markov approximation. And it's uh, the approximation in the end, it's basically uh, gives you uh, uh, like the rate of change of the density matrix as terms which are second order in this uh, coupling constant epsilon. Okay. And it's um, uh, Markovian in the sense that you don't have memory terms in the equation. Okay. So, I mean, typically when you try to do this sort of thing, I mean, what you find is that the, uh, uh, the uh, evolution of the system at time t depends on what happened far off, okay. So then you do a Markovian approximation and then you find that things depend only at the same time. Okay, so when you do this bond Markov approximation, what you get is something called the Redfield equation. Okay. And then if you do further approximations, you get something called the Lindblad equation, okay. So these are uh, basically, you, this is the starting point and then you obtain these various descriptions by uh, doing various approximations. Okay, so the Lindblad equation has a lot of, I mean, uh, some advantage that you can prove things like positivity and uh, so on, which makes it uh, kind of uh, uh, like uh, uh, people like it uh, because of various properties it has. Redfield equation is uh, more uh, connected to the original uh, uh, equations, uh, but you can't prove things like positivity and so on. Uh, so uh, sometimes there are like people prefer to use the Red Lindblad uh, description. Okay, so uh, basically the Redfield and uh, Lindblad equations are widely used to describe systems such as cold atoms, small molecules, quantum dots, uh, cavity QD, and so these are very uh, widely used uh, equations. And uh, I mean, I think more uh, commonly the Lindblad description is used because it's simpler and also because of the, what I mentioned about the positivity property. Okay, so in this work what we did is basically we wanted to compare this Redfield and Lindblad uh, master equation approaches by comparing them with exact results, okay. So, uh, so uh, and the exact results are obtained from this quantum Langevin approach, which can be used for non-interacting systems. 
Okay, and also we do some uh, sort of exact non equilibrium uh, numerics. Okay, so what we do is we look at a very simple model where there are just two sites. I mean, it could be this uh, sites on the benzene molecule, uh, where I mean you can have put uh, like either bosons or fermions which uh, hop around, and then these are connected to uh, two reservoirs. Okay, and these reservoirs can be at different temperatures or different chemical potentials. So these are the two sites, and you can uh, either put uh, fermions or bosons on them, and they move around, and in, uh, and then you want to calculate various non equilibrium properties. Uh, so you could uh, do uh, uh, look at various things. You could either look at steady state properties, which means you connect this uh, reservoirs and then wait for long enough, or you could just look at transient properties, like uh, how does this system actually evolve to a steady state or even to an equilibrium state. So these are the two things we look at, and uh, uh, and if uh, if like I said, if you look at a non-interacting model, then you can use this uh, quantum Langevin approach to actually get a lot of exact results. So therefore, it's, you can uh, uh, do a detailed uh, comparison between these two approaches and the uh, Langevin equation approach. So this is the detailed model that uh, we write. I mean, uh, so you have, uh, I mean, you can either think of like two uh, cavity modes which are coupled in some way and then interacting with reservoirs, or you can think of uh, like it, uh, electrons uh, going in some uh, uh, molecule. Uh, and the basic Hamiltonian looks like this. I mean, like these two sides and there's some hopping Hamiltonian. And these are the reservoirs. So reservoirs are, like I said, non-interacting uh, collection of uh, uh, fermions or bosons. And then there's some interaction, which is also just quadratic. Okay. So, uh, so the important terms are the, this intra-system coupling, G, and the in, uh, this, uh, coupling between the system and bath, which is modeled by this epsilon parameter. So, uh, so these various uh, um, uh, master equations uh, like uh, Lindblad and uh, Redfield are usually valid. I mean, depending on uh, the domains, domains of validity depend on this coupling parameter. So, I'll just uh, talk about the main conclusions of the uh, of our work. So, what we find is that the Redfield master equation actually gives uh, uh, the correct physics. Uh, I mean, under this bond approximation, both for steady state and long time dynamics. Okay. So, for wide range of very wide range of parameter values, uh, and our parameters are those uh, epsilon and g. We find that they, this Redfield equation works really well. The uh, Lindblad uh, equations, and there are various forms of the Lindblad equations. They seem to suffer from various pathologies and have a very limited domain of validity. Okay. So, I mean, these pathologies don't occur in the Redfield equations. Uh, and then we find that uh, the Redfield uh, master equation actually uh, captures many, I mean, uh, 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 sort of physics which uh, are, which have, could have exper interesting experimental uh, consequences. And these are missed by the traditional Lindblad approaches. Uh, so, this is sort of an open problem uh, that we, one can't prove the non positivity of the Lindblad equations. But it doesn't seem to uh, be a problem in actually reproducing exact results. Okay, so for more details, uh, you can see the poster. We have time for questions. Rishik, you write down the model Hamiltonian in this theory of double quantum dot, no? Yeah. Uh, just, just also in the, almost in the non-interacting yes, picture. Yes, two non-interacting. Two non-interacting. Right. Thank you. Other questions? You seem to feel that the Einstein's Markovian approximation is higher level than the other non-Markovian approximation. No, it's Sorry. at the same level, but same it, level. So yeah, it's more I mean, it an approximation exactly while the others right. were called approximations. No, sorry. Einstein's rate equation was called exact, while others were called. Uh, no, I didn't call it. Did I call it exact? I know. I, I know. And it was Einstein. So you're. <laughs> oh, there's. Sorry. Yeah. Just so you mentioned that the you know the quantum Langevin equation, you can do it only for non-interacting. So right. What is the problem of interacting? Uh, okay. So. Okay, in the interact, in non interact you can write the equations, but you can't solve them. Okay, that's basically, I mean, it's like classical nonlinear equation, so you can't get any exact results. I mean, like, 
and actually it's even difficult to simulate it. Uh, like you can, uh, like classically at least you could simulate, it's easy to simulate a uh, classical nonlinear uh, Langeva equation, but quantum mechanically even that's hard. I mean, like the usual problem of simulating quantum systems. So you mentioned about the off-diagonal elements, right? So the uh, strength of these elements is decided by the system bath coupling. If it's strong enough, then uh, the bath will uh, decohere the system, right? Uh, is there any correlation between the two? No, I mean, okay. Uh, you are saying whether if uh, coupling is weak, then the rho uh, one two is necessarily off-diagonal elements. They will be retained. If the coupling is strong, I mean, it will be order like epsilon. I mean, the octagonal elements are typically order epsilon square. I think, uh, like the coupling square. Mm -hmm. so, but they are sometimes like physical observables. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, having a, something like a quantum phase transition, I don't know. Uh, okay. No, why? I mean, like, uh, for example, if they're equal temperatures, I mean, it's uh, uh, then octagonal elements. Okay. Uh, okay. If uh, equal temperature, maybe they vanish. But uh, no, in general, I don't think it will vanish. I mean, even if it's an equilibrium system, the octagonal elements need not vanish. Right? Like in the site basis, I mean, in the, the energy basis, it vanishes. But in a site basis, it, I mean, it, it won't vanish. Thank you.